I want to warmly welcome our guest, invited guests, Nazan Havin and Andre, to this seminar series of constructing the epistemologies of the South about the philosophy behind Rojava in Kurdistan. Allow to me to mention that the Constructing the Epistemologies of the South series aspires to promote spaces for the exchange of knowledge and mutual learnings. Our purpose as a research program in SESH is twofold. On one hand, aiming towards a dialogue capable of problematizing silences, absences, and incommunicabilities and on the other, aiming towards a space capable of creating acknowledgements, translations, for the sake of an alternative thinking of alternatives. Having this in mind today, we are special honored to have the opportunity to hear and discuss with you three militant intellectuals that I will introduce in one minute. The theme of this seminar couldn't be more interesting and relevant to us here. We live in a problematic and challenging world. We are witnessing, on one hand, the growth of misogynistic, warlike and predatory authoritarianism in many places of the world. On the other hand, hope and emancipation is nourished by popular movements that break with established order and courageously build concrete alternatives. If you allow me, I want to salute the Colombian people in this moment um, for their victory last Sunday and democracy and peace will over fear and violence. Thank you so much, Colombian people, for us. By the same token, we have learned many lessons from Rojava that we need to deepen, and this is our opportunity this afternoon. In the words of our esteemed colleagues, Stefania Barca and Jaya Picardi, my wonderful student making an incredible doctoral thesis on Rojava and genealogy. Democratic confederalism in Rojava can be described as an autonomous life project opposing the patriarchal statistic order of capitalist modernity and proposing, they are proposing to us, radical democracy, women's leading role and ecology. One of the most original features of this emancipatory design is the recovery of Rojava's matristic culture through a new body of knowledge collectively developed on the part of the Kurdish women's movement they call <coughs> genealogy or the science of women and life. This is the words of Jaya. I want just to introduce briefly our guest, invited guests. Uh, I start with Nazan. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know if I will say well your family name. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, Nazat It's patriarchal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wrote extensively on social policy, gender subjectivities, and state violence in Kurdistan. She has also worked as a columnist in the journal Mkota and the newspaper Uzgur Guden. No, I don't know. Her opinion pieces appeared in venues as Bayonet, T24, or Magazine, and another name difficult to me, Ia Dalia. Exactly. <laughs> is a member of the Women for Peace and Academics for Peace, and most recently she is finishing a book manuscript with the working title Mother, Politician and Guerrilla, The Emergence of a New Political Cosmology in Kurdistan through women's bodies and speech. Next, having Gunese is the author of The Art of Freedom, Brief History of the Kurdish Struggle. She is an engineer, journalist, and women's rights activist who writes and speak extensively on the topic of revolution in Rojava. She is one of the spokespersons of the international initiative Freedom for Abdullah Ocalan, Peace in Kurdistan, and translator, translator of several Ocalan's books. And it's my great pleasure to welcome as well Andre Grubac. Grubac. Grub. Yeah, okay. Today I'm making the, the game of the patriarchal family names. 
is the editor of the Journal of World System Research and the founding chair of the Anthropology and Social Change Department of, at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, and now our dear uh, collaborator researcher at SESH in the University of Coimbra. He taught at the University of Rojava and he is the author, most recently, of Living at the Edge of Capitalism, Adventures in Exile and Mutual Aid. Co-authored with Dennis Orin and awarded in 2017 American Sociologi Sociological Association Prize for Distinguished Scholarship. So these are our incredible panel today. Is it okay with you? Thank you. The order will be having first, then Andre, and we will finish with us. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa and Sesh, for inviting us and holding uh, this uh, discussion. I, I do believe maybe it's a bit of a belated discussion too, because uh, of the area that Sesh researches. Um, the Kurdish freedom movement or Kurdish people uh, have been struggling in modern times more than 50 years very resiliently to recover, reclaim and rebuild. So it's not just about a critique, but it's also at the end of this 50 years of struggling, it's reaching a point and an understanding how to actually rebuild an alternative way of thinking, living, desiring, uh, etc. So uh, therefore, I, I believe this is an extremely important uh, dialogue and discussion. Now, of course, uh, to understand the political philosophy behind the revolution in Rojava, one needs to really understand, again, it's a topic I know it's in discussion in uh, Portugal as well, decolonization uh, of the Kurdish phenomena and the decolonization, of course, in Ajalan's political philosophy. I think it's, it's important. So you, I want to give a bit of a context and uh, I, I know that my other friends will be complimenting, will be complimenting each other on, on this discussion. So, um, so you may have heard about the Kurdish question or you know that Kurdistan is divided into four parts or you may not have, you may not have heard about it. But this division has gone on for more than a century now or just about a century right now. And in fact it was, um, Öcalan was the person who introduced the notion uh, that there is a colonial situation into the discourse of the big masses of the Kurdish people. Um, so therefore, um, his whole development as a philosopher, as a writer, and as a political leader, rests on the conclusions that he reached um, in the early 1970s. So he began with the word Kurdistan is a colony. Uh, it was very difficult at the time. Maybe I'll go into it a little bit uh, later as I talk about it. It was so difficult that even to share this with others required extreme secrecy. And um, because the state and its different forces inside the society were always there waiting to suffocate any attempt by the Kurdish community or the society to overcome. Uh, all of this. So, um, so he actually wrote uh, to this end maybe more than 60 books. You know, uh, 13 or so of these books are after 1999, uh, after he was abducted uh, from prison. But let me correct that his prison conditions are so severe, of course, that his his jailers do not allow him to write any books. So it might be deceptive to call the, the writings after 1999 as books. They are actually defenses to various courts, whether domestic courts in Turkey or the, the European Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. But the fact of the matter is that he has developed this process 
of decolonization through, as I said, recovery, reclaiming, and also rebuilding throughout these um, 60 uh, books and, and texts. So I guess, um, and of course, all this political philosophy, he also developed through different directions, as you will see when we talk about it, because he didn't only stick to the Kurdish national question, but he probed further to be able to understand uh, how this colonization process took place, what it took away from the Kurds, and you know what the current status quo was. So during the years of ideological formation, which was the 1970s, the first group formation was 1973, and then the political party was actually founded in 1978, so it took them five years to build it up, you know, to hold discussions, to actually be able to understand the history of the Kurds, because everything was just so uh, illegitimate to be a Kurd. It was so um, suppressed and repressed that at the time, most of the Kurds did not even know that Kurdistan was four parts. You know, they would not even know the other parts. And uh, so therefore, the historical aspect uh, was totally uh, suppressed as well. So of course, Öcalan and his friends at the time were heavily influenced by anti-colonial struggles like the ones in Vietnam, Angola, Algeria, and of course, Franz Fanon was also a big thing with Öcalan and, and with the movement as well. So um, in the beginning, of course, the critique targeted the Turkish state in order to be able to expose uh, the, the colonial ways of the Turkish state. Um, and then, you know, in all areas of life, so economic, uh, but most so in terms, as the time moved, in terms of the personalities that were created as a result of this uh, severe uh, colonization in all uh, walks of life, I guess, all, all areas of life. So, um, knowledge about this conflict as a result um, was severely restricted, not only for the Kurds, but basically for everybody. You know, I guess uh, you probably increasingly heard about the Kurds, you know, maybe first in 1999, when Öcalan was abducted and the Kurds was, were, you know, out on the streets all around the world and did not allow uh, execution of Öcalan to take place illegally. And then maybe you heard more about it after Rojava revolution, you know. So therefore, this 50 years of resilience and uh, thus the fruits of it in terms of Rojava revolution, the resistance in Shengal, you know, uh, of the Yazidi, Yazidi people, as well as some other project like in Mahmur, Camp Mahmur, and also in, in, in the Kurdish regions in Turkey, which we call North Kurdistan, uh, you wouldn't have heard any of this if it wasn't for this continuous and resilient, but also, as I said, this um, multi-directional uh, and dimensional uh, decolonization uh, process. So, um, th there has been several layers of colonialism over Kurdistan, actually, throughout time, because of its geostrategic and geo geographical uh, situation. But Kurds are autochthonous to the, to the region. And um, there has been, of course, multitude of empires has been through it, you know from Alexander the Great to, I don't know, even the, you know, Jalan calls the first colonization the, the, the Sumerian one, you know, that, that's how it began, especially in terms of resources, that the, the city-states uh, at the time needed timber, and that timber was actually in the homeland of the, you know, uh, predecessor of the Kurds, 
um, in that area, so that's where the first actually colonization efforts uh, took place. But then, of course, we had the Arabic Islamic expansion uh, as well, which meant that the, another layer of colonization was in terms of belief, you know, because Kurds and their belief system is not Abrahamic, uh, actually. So it's not an Abrahamic religion um, in that sense. Uh, it's Ezidi, it's Zoroastrianism, it's more uh, in, in that vein. So therefore, there is also that kind of colonization that comes into to play. And then there's, of course, um, at the same time, because in, in the Middle East, it's always intertwined with the religion, uh, other majority or the nation state nations ethnic identity uh, colonization uh, over the Kurds. Um, then of course on top of that came the European colonization. You know this is what I mean of course with this agency of nation states because it equated a state with a nation uh, therefore anyone who didn't belong to that nation uh, not only the Kurds, but others, um, uh, they were basically almost wiped out. As you may know, like Assyrians, uh, Armenian presence, you know, and, um, and many others uh, in, the, in the region. So intertwined with the Cold War, <laughs> of course, came in the neoliberalism and the U.S. intervention uh, into the region uh, more severely. That also brought along with it, of course, the, um, uh, the fortification uh, of, of making the nation states more stronger uh, in, in the face of you know, resistance struggles in the area. And especially if you were left wing, you, know, you basically had no chance, I guess. You know. I sometimes call the PKK like a Molotov cocktail, you know, especially coming uh, into existence uh, during this Cold War phase um, when the US and other imperial uh, powers were backing uh, nationalist na nation states um, and, uh, and um, fortifying them through religionism you know, especially Islamist uh, uh, ways and especially nationalist ways so that they would be um, not so open to the uh, Soviet, let's say, or the left-wing influences. So therefore, you know, they, these like created many layers um, of armor uh, and made it very difficult for Kurds to penetrate through them. Um, maybe this was a good thing, actually, because of the reason why I say it's a good thing, I think it, lay, it, it led Öcalan and his group of friends at the beginning to, to think more profoundly about issues. You know, they didn't just become a satellite movement of, you know, the Soviet Union, China, or, or whatever. Because, uh, because the Soviet Union or China or Cuba uh, never supported the, the PKK and the Kurdish freedom movement, although the PKK expressly says it's a, you know, Marxist-Leninist uh, at its inception is a Marxist-Leninist uh, movement. The, the only ones that um, actually uh, showed some solidarity and support were, were some parts of the Palestinian movement given the PKK um, space for uh, military and political education in Lebanon, in the Beka Valley, you know. So, um, so therefore, you know, uh, the layers that we have as a result is that, and the old left also added to this layer because any attempt by Kurds to, to express themselves was met with the left of, let's say, Iran, left of, let's say, Arabic states, left of Turkey, uh, to brand this uh, struggle as nationalism, you know, because they would say, yeah, why, you know, why, why would you want to say you're Kurdish? It's all about class. So, you know, once we have this uh, class struggle 
um, you know, everyone will be free anyway. So, so therefore, you know, these, these also made things very difficult and, and hard as a result. So it meant that there, there was a multi-dimensional and directional struggle all the time. Um, and of course, when, when this coming of capitalist structures uh, came into the Middle East, the Kurds were totally excluded. Uh, with that, what I mean is that although, of course, you know, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, uh, they were also, let's say, semi-colonial or dependent states on, on these um, world powers, imperialist powers, but then again, they were uh, developed in terms of their bourgeoisie, their media, their military, their police, and they actually interpreted this nation state to the uh, to the to the most right wing and fascistic uh, manner, um, to the point that you know either other peoples were obliterated, as I mentioned the names, or in the case of Kurds, uh, not only they maybe they weren't terminated totally in terms physically, but uh, there was a prohibition on on their their language was banned. Uh, most severe case is, is uh, probably Turkey, um, although, of course, as you might know, in Iraq, Saddam used chemical weapons, uh, but there, at least, you know, they were recognized as Kurds and uh, as, as existing. So, um, therefore, what we are finding is that in all the four different parts, uh, let's say with the Arabic states, Iraq and, and Syria, um, although, okay, there is a recognition that Kurds exist, you know, but they, they don't see it as a colonization. They don't see the Kurdish territory or land, homeland being invaded. Because they feel that um, Islam is the big nation, and that nation is Arab. <laughs> so, therefore, what are the Kurds complaining about, you know? And with Iran, with, with uh, Iran, it's, it's, uh, they see this, the Kurdish ethnicity as a subgroup of Persians. So they again think, okay, you know, why are you complaining? You are the subgroup of this great nation. And there is a Kurdish region in Iran. And so any, any demand by Kurds for their individual and collective rights is again seen as a mud throne at the, this great Persianness, um, Turkey, I guess, was was the the most deceptive, and um, I say deceptive. I'll explain that in a minute. But the most dire and and you know uh, barbaric. Um, I don't want to use the word barbaric because Öcalan uses the <laughs> word barbaric in a very positive sense when he criticizes civilization. You know, but it's cold-blooded murder in every sense because. Uh, they, they claim various absurd things. They claim that the whole place was empty when they came, you know, and then when you, if you put them under pressure too much, then they claim that they, you know, occupied and invaded it with their uh, power, military power, and therefore it is their right, you know. And, uh, and they, they declare Kurds non-existent. To the point, you know, Nazan would know that better, that to the academia, you know, they were told to make research, maybe not during your time, but before that, um, to make research on Kurds and to show how Kurds are mountain Turks, that, you know, they are actually Turkish. And uh, so therefore, you know, when all these different means and methods are, are implemented, uh, uh, and, you know, on the one hand, there is the ideological construction that, you know, they are mountain Turks. Actually, they are the, 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 the better Turks, you know. They are the genuine Turks, you know. And um, so when this is combined with the punishment you receive, if you say you're Kurdish, and that all economical areas and social life is totally shut off to you. So therefore, the only area for you to survive is to become a Turk, 
because that means power, that means you can live, that means you know you can have a career, you know that means actually forget about a career, you stay alive. You know it it was it was and today it is still that harsh that reality is the case because in Turkey especially being a Kurd is equated to being a separatist it's equated with um, backstabbing you know those who are feeding you <laughs> I, I guess this is the kind of equilibrium set up between mm -hmm. all the colonizers and the colonized including men and women you know in that regard um, so um, therefore and, it, and let me just talk a little bit about how the the Europe how Europe and the world system comes into this uh, because I think Erdogan experienced this firsthand when he was he came to Europe um, to be able to find a solution to the Kurdish question in a political and a peaceful manner um, instead of you know, going to the mountains when in 1998 there was great pressure uh, asserted by Turkey, backed by Israel and and the US and the UK to push Erdogan out, out of Syria because that's where he was staying. So, but when he came to Europe, um, he found no place for himself. You know, the airspace was shut in Netherlands, you know, he was thrown from Greece to Russia to Kyrgyzstan to back to Greece to Italy and, you know, and finally in Kenya, although he was promised a safe passage by the Greek state to South Africa, to Mandela, um, but this was not the case. He was delivered to Kenya and once in Kenya, you know, he understood that the world system how it operates uh, and that Kurdistan is in fact not just a colony of these four states but it's a decision by this whole world system to leave it like that and to keep it like that you know I, I always say this if, if you want to understand if this is the case or not have a look none of the perpetrators of crimes against humanity towards the Kurds have ever ever been tried, including Saddam Hussein. He was executed before and without being tried for crimes against the Kurds. You know, ISIS, I mean, these days we are hearing the Russian soldiers should be tried on an inter international tribunal, but ISIS, <laughs> where everybody agrees and thinks that, you know, uh, there has been crimes against humanity. They haven't been tried on a. On a oh, really? I haven't even begun getting into the topic. <laughs> okay, but I'm sure my, my friends are going to uh, do do justice to to this these 50 years. So, um, but I want to discuss the political aspect a little bit more to be able to understand, you know, as I said, why Öcalan, the PKK, and the Kurdish Freedom Movement as a whole dare to imagine something outside of this system and dare to question it to the, to the roots of the problems um, and to, to be able to connect, you know, uh, the struggles uh, for freedom of not only the Kurds, presently, but of women, of the men's situation, you know. I mean, it's not after 1999 that Öcalan and PKK has an interest in the, in, in the women's freedom. On the contrary, in 1996, Öcalan was already talking about killing the dominant men, you know. And from there, actually moved into what he describes as women being the the, the very first nation, no, the very first people who are not a nation that is colonized, you know, describes women in, in, that, in those terms. There's an amazing uh, theory that he has reached beneath all this, you know. 
But I want to say a few words about the criminalization of the PKK. And I, I think it's, it's helpful to situate it inside this world system, that how they are, they are, Kurds are trying to be marginalized, pushed to the margins, criminalized for defending themselves and trying to stay alive, you know. The very first criminalization of the PKK uh, was, I think, in 1986 by Sweden. So it's not for nothing that, that, that Turkey <coughs> is at the moment pushing Sweden harder than it's pushing Finland. You know. uh, it was first Sweden. It blamed the um, killing of its uh, Prime Minister, Olive Palma, at the time on the PKK without any evidence. You know, and banned the PKK as a result of it. <laughs> and at the time, though, let me tell you that 1986 um, was just after the PKK had just started the armed struggle because it started it in 1984. So it was founded in 78, but the armed struggle was much later in 1984. And in 1980, there was a military coup in Turkey, a very bloody one. You know. Uh, the whole, whole thousands of, and tens of thousands of people would be gathered in stadiums, you know. Um, loads of people were imprisoned and severe torture, you know, uh, uh, would be done to them uh, in order to break the movement. And at such a time came the ban of Sweden, uh, for example to whitewash what Turkey is doing. You know, it, 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 of course, ringed as a support for Turkey's human rights abuses <coughs> uh, against the Kurds. The second ban came in 1993 of Germany. And this was also a very interesting time because it was the height of, actually, uh, severe repression towards the Kurds who actually openly uh, supported the PKK uh, in Turkey. And uh, this ban came in 1993 after Turkey, with warplanes, bombed a town uh, which was popularly supporting, as I said, the PKK. And uh, the town was devastated, and as a result, Kurds in Germany um, occupied the autobahns, they are famous autobahns, you know, how can you do that, of course. And, um, and as a result, because of these autobahn protests, which were there, they burned tires, car tires, etc., the Kurds. So as a result of that, they banned the PKK, which ultimately, of course, concealed the bombing of the town, <laughs> but pushed forward the protests and uh, uh, contributed um, strengthening uh, Turkey's showing of the freedom movement as a separatist and a, and a terrorist um, organization. And this continues to date. I mean, Turkey finds courage, you know, although it invades and occupies Afrin and ethnic cleanses it, um, nobody's saying anything to that. And then there are more than 40 military bases in Iraqi Kurdistan, although it's doing all of this contrary to international agreements, it is getting support to continuously not only uh, wage war uh, towards the Kurds, but also to declare them uh, terrorist with the help of um, uh, Europe. So, but there is remedies, and my friends will talk a little bit more about that. I think without this context, the profundity of the problem, we cannot understand the profound exit out of the system. Great context, important, I think, to, to begin with. Uh, having Nazar and myself have done this before, and on several occasions, and uh, I just want to say that last time we did it was with our friend David Draper. And 
to a six left us. So I just want to signal you this moment to signal his absence. We miss him dearly. And uh, I was thinking about David a lot a few days ago. I was giving, actually, a few weeks ago, I was giving a talk in an unspecified, unnamed Western European country. <laughs> <laughs> where I was giving a talk on this book, Sociology of Freedom, which was recently published. And uh, after giving this talk, there was this fascinating question from a very nice person in the audience. And he asked me, well, who do you think is the most influential, he asked, revolutionary theorist alive? And I said, well, I do think it's Abdullah Hodel. And he looked at me as if I was completely in shape. <laughs> there was a polite chuckle, there was some disbelief, people were confused. And he continued to press, and he said, why? I said, well, you know, it's uh, somebody whose writings have influenced and shaped and informed the writings, the thinking, the behavior of millions of people, and inspired or helped inspire a whole revolution, ongoing revolution, in the place that we call the Rondera. And he was not very convinced. He said, we certainly must be joking. I mean, we are talking about somebody who is a human rights case. I said, yes, he's in prison, but so was Gramsci. Oh, now you are comparing Ogerland with Gramsci. That's just preposterous. Said, okay. Well, who is the most important revolutionary theorist to you? And he said, well, it's Antonio Negri. And I said, okay, I mean, I like Antonio Negri, but I don't think that Antonio Negri had that kind of an impact on something that is happening right now, unfolding with a truly inspiring people in a place that we are told, habituated almost, to think and discount as the most unlikely place to have a women-led revolution, which is the Middle East. He was absolutely not convinced by my response, but I was very confused by his obstinance. And, uh, I spent several years trying to understand Abdullah Hodgman intellectually, not only as the leader of the Kurdish movement, not only as somebody who went through this profound transformation in prison, but as somebody who is actually a sociologist, sociologist of freedom, somebody who is a revolutionary theorist. And wherever I go, whenever I speak about Hodgman, I receive a version of this. And David used to say, well, don't be surprised. He's an authority, or person in the position of authority, who's using his authority to empower or to discourage anti-authoritarianism, to create or inspire anti-authoritarian movement. He's also a man who's using his position in order to inspire the killing of the dominant male or the hegemonic male, inspire a women-led transformation of the movement. And finally, he's also a theorist, David used to say, who writes theory that's very different than the high Marxist canon, as David used to call it. He writes theory in a way that it discourages the kind of pronouncements that are very final, that are very decisive, and he's somehow always open for further elaboration of his thoughts. I think this is true. Nazan actually had a fun uh, compliment to this yesterday night when you said he's also a Middle Eastern man with mustache. <laughs> but it's a good question. Why do we not take Abdullah Hodran seriously as an intellectual? Is it because he's a Kurd? Is it because he's not Italian? Is it because he's not Gramsci? Is it because of all of these things that Nazan and David suggested? Perhaps. I wanted to add another possible wrinkle explanation to this, which is that he writes from a place, or he theorizes from a place, that is absolutely impossible for many people to actually contextualize and situate. Emmanuel Wallerstein used to say that capitalist modernity is a place, is a situation, is a geoculture that was established through the formation of liberal ideology, centrist liberalism. And centrist liberalism, according to Emmanuel, had four main parts. The first was building of a bourgeois modern nation state. The second was the building of the modern idea of citizenship, which was exclusive of women, exclusive of people who belong to other nations, ethnicities and races, and exclusive of so-called dangerous classes. The third pillar of centrist liberalism 
was what he called private relation, private property relation, namely capitalism, but also with its statist cousin and relative public or state or property. And finally, the fourth one was social sciences, and social sciences that were shaped by certain linearity of thought, stadialism, at least from Adam Smith, probably even from before. And that is something that kind of enshrines the focus of social sciences on the triad, the dual triad of market, society, and politics being the same. Now, <clears throat> Abdul Hodran actually writes about something very different. He says from the beginning, there is something that is non-synchronous, something that is, cannot be synchronized, something that is out of sync. There's a different time, and that time is democratic time, that begins even before, before the emergence of hierarchical society, but definitely the opposition. It's a counter-cultural sort, oppositional modernity, democratic modernity, that instead of modern state, has something that's called democratic confederalism. Instead of the private property relation, instead of the public state property relation, it has something that's called usufro, property that is owned or actually not owned but used in common. Instead of the exclusive idea of modern European Jacobin citizenship, it has something else. It has the idea of democratic nation, which actually rests on the liberation of women, which is related to the liberation of life and nature itself, which goes straight against the foundational dualism of modernity, which is one between society and nature. And finally, instead of social sciences, what he writes about is sociology of freedom, which is a complete negation of everything that social sciences in a liberal uh, sense actually stand for. So Ocalan is an unusual figure, and his theory in that sense, I think, is really difficult to grasp. It reminds me, and I'm going to say a few words about what I think about the historical method that he uses in order to decipher the democratic modernity. And it reminds me actually of the idea that Ander Breton had offered, but he was trying to describe what is the model of a surrealist picture, of surrealist image, of surrealist painting. He had this enigmatic idea that it is an image of a man cut in two by a window that is at the same time a mirror. And what Benjamin, well, Benjamin what uh, Breton was trying to say, that this is, in a certain sense, artful combination in which exterior mingles with the interior, in which two sides really reflect each other. And this is how I think about the historical method that Ogilvy is using throughout this book and many other books that he wrote. So, critique and self-critique. They're not cut in two, but they're creatively juxtaposed. If the window corresponds to dialectical critique, which is fundamental for Ogilva, the mirror reflects a very insightful and very difficult self-critique, critical self-interrogation of the concepts of power, of the state and political party, and of the violence, while critically and carefully balancing analytical and emotional intelligence. Let him to embrace democratic, ecological, and women-centered revolutionary politics. So his critique and self-critique are braided through and shaping his historical method. He understands very well that it takes more than she to make things visible. He debunks the idea of finding the absolute truth in the conventional historical assessments. He always asks, in each one of his books, how is it possible to separate the idea of scientific truth from that of a true society? While the dialectical knowledge that he espouses seeks to raise the stone under which the monster of modern capitalism lies, positivist historical research opposes such a desire. Within positivism, Audran says, curiosity is punished, utopia is expelled, fantasy is prohibited. Knowledge resigns itself to being mere repetitive construction. Knowledge, in a certain sense, just like life under factory discipline, becomes impoverished. And the felicity of knowledge, as Adorno said, is not to be. So in this scientistic syndrome of thought, of positivism, the goal of knowledge is confused with the means of knowledge. For any positivist, the system is something positive. For dialecticians, like Adorno, the system is the core of what must be criticized. So for a good positivist, always eager to quantify, art, mythology, imagination, they all serve as a rubbish bin 
for everything that is excluded from this experience. Social sciences in that sense are nothing but political concepts, and as Audrelan convincingly suggests, they are constructed entirely in the service of the state and capital. Now, Lukács in his history of the history and class consciousness defined as the social type that is most dialectical extreme of reification in a journalist. There's nothing worse than a journalist in usual way. He might be right, but I actually think that politely disagree with him, and I think it is more professional historians who are at the extreme end of this reification, who are completely lost in fragmentary analysis of these green shreds of the past, and who are completely deaf to history. And this is what Ojalan is trying to do in all of his books. He's trying to show that history is not what historians see or make visible. Now, like the great historian William McNeil, he argues not for something that is called history, but something that we could call myth history, one word, which is a project in which historians provide a sense of the past, broad but very intelligible, meaningful interpretation of the past, as a basis for rebellion against the present. And that to me is a key of understanding of the order. Because this rebellion against the present is filled with signs, filled with traces of antagonistic temporalities whose contents and forms are expressions of a history that is much, much older. From this point of view, non-hierarchical forms are not archaic forms or stages that even Marxism see as stages of history, but antagonistic temporalities and contemporary alternatives. So Ojalan says from the beginning that there is democratic time that is completely out of sync with normative rhythms and temporalities of the dominant time. The task of his myth history is to look for those possibilities and examples of different social relations that are obscured by the temporalities of capital and the state. Now the idea that the truth resides in original documents, I have to say this, I'm a historian by training, so I have a bit of a problem with historians, as you might, might notice. The idea that truth resides in original documents, and that only if we move closer to those documents, we are moving closer and closer to the truth, is a complete rubbish. We are moving closer and closer to incoherence. What we need, instead, is intelligible world, and there is absolutely no sense in pretending that all that we need is more detail. Uh, Audran writes somewhere, that we have poisoned humanity almost to death with rational understanding. I think he's right. Instead of this, he says, let's relegate facts to the status of background knowledge. They're deserving only to be disregarded. It can only matter in a given situation when it becomes recognizable. Only some facts matter for any given pattern. Otherwise, useless clutter will obscure what we are after, and what we are after is perceptual relations among important facts. So on a subtle basis, relegating the background noise of conventional interpretation and positivist accumulation of swarming facts, he established perceptible relations among the facts that is able to comprehend how the tradition that I have talked about can be revitalized in order to train the present. And in order to do this, he makes his decolonizing move. He does two things, a double movement of sorts. He says that we need to transfer the things from the future into the present, something that sociologists nowadays like to call the figurative. But he also says that we need to reveal the temporalities of the past that were hidden and obscured by the present. And this actually reminds me of what Boaventura likes to say about the sociology of emergencies and sociology of absences. This kind of method is extremely useful in discovering what I think is crucial for order, which is to build a decolonizing project in which the present will be provincialized and the past will be deprovincialized by revealing these multiple historical temporalities and, as Nazan likes to say, bring them into one new revolutionary temporality. So I think this is a very practical mode of intervention into history. He presents a completely different consideration of time and space, creates a new terrain of responsibilities and possibilities. And he reminds me a little bit of an archaeologist who investigates the archaeological site, 
not as a space of the past, but as centuries and millennia, because she usually writes about at least 5,000 years of history, that exist contemporaneously before our eyes. He refuses to escape to the state, unlike Enki Luki, who likes to invoke, and he is not seduced by the liberal ordering of the official time. He searches for antagonistic temporalities revealed by his historical method, moving through this useless clutter of official facts and what Fred Jameson calls the fog of history. But just like positivist historians confuse the means and ends, so does the modern revolutionary, which is the other target that Oberon has. His signature contribution is to recognize that both revolutionary socialists of a certain kind and liberal reformers belong to the same temporal logic of capitalism. Soviet socialism was realized by this logic through Gulag, and today the same logic still excuses liberal imperialism. The Leninist conception of steel and cement socialism and productivist visions of traditionalist Marxism are both complicit in this progressivist myth that is emblematic of the liberal conception of history. A new political temporality beyond state, power, and violence is needed, is necessary, and is already present in the layers of the antagonistic, anachronistic past. It needs to be recovered rather than invented which I think is a crucial key in the colonizing project. Democratic socio-ecological communal society is neither the break in a Benjaminian sense, nor the acceleration of civilization. It is an alternative to the entire course of hierarchical society. Now, this is a revolutionary politics that is very unusual because it rejects restitutionism. Return to the archaic past, in a certain sense, would involve a linear model of time. So, none of that. Instead, it cautions us that a mistake made by modern revolutionaries, but also modern scholars, not only historians, was to assert that unilinear temporality with the Hegelian modern nation state at the other end of the developmentalist arrow banishes antagonistic temporalities and political forms, what Murray Bookchin, a great influence on Abdullah Hogeman, used to call legacy of freedom. So organized on these different temporal registers, Ojalan's method, Ojalan's work, shows a historical method that can have connections with our lived experience, and it's a strikingly original move. The result is a qualitatively different, I believe, regime of historical time. The idea is not to restore the pre-modern past, but to make a detour via the past towards the future in which we could recover the art of democratic and communal living. And at the center of all of this, is democratic nation, and more than anything else, the figure of a woman, the first slave, the first colony of the patriarchal state of society. Ojalan, as I have mentioned, accords specific and special salience to the restored dignity of women as a premise, as a condition of sine qua non of any egalitarian politics. And right now, capitalism, he says, and US, America, hegemonic civilization, model, are in crisis. And we are living in something that he calls the chaos interval of capital civilization, which is really interesting in the way that he is in his telling. He says it's a key moment in time and space in which we, meaning all of us, might be able to rectify history for the future. And in this restorative historicity, history is narrated into the future, and capitalist modernity becomes the backward past, violent and morally completely unjustifiable. As we walk into the present, we have the future behind and the past in front of us. Time has looped on itself to reveal a solidarity of women and men across the centuries, but also to show us in a full view the utmost and complete poverty of the liberal utopia. The essence of parochial, Eurocentered concept of liberal utopia is the idea of the sovereign nation state anchored to a bounded territory, as well as a belief in inevitability and moral quality of progress, nation-state, and capitalism. Now, Ojalan turns this idea upside down. His appropriation of history challenges the Eurocentric division of time and space, inferiority and superiority, civilization and barbarism. Uh, the entire geography of modernization, including this essential dichotomy between nature and society. So against this utopian finality, liberal politics, he speaks of something that he calls democratic intervals, 
space times of mutual aid, of democracy, of cooperation, of communalism, as practices retrieved from both past and present, but entirely integral to the lived contemporary democratic modernity. Now, Odeland reminds us that history is forever unresolved. History is a field of unfinished possibilities. We reach back to refuse some possibilities, but we also reach back to select other possibilities. He urges us to refuse the liberal version of civilization and progress. But he's also not very kind to Lenin, and Lenin's vision of state-centered internationalism and national liberation problem. If politics is a process, as he thinks that it is, and I tend to agree, of liberation of the natural and moral society from the state, national liberation should be thought of as a rupture with the modern concept of the nation. It is the right time, this Polestine's Kairos, to wake up from this utopian dream of modernity, of capitalist modernity, of nation states, and focus our collective energy on the utopistics of the democratic world of federalism. Now, Odeland has addressed it somewhere, having will tell me where exactly, that he had not one birth, but three. His first birth was his biological birth, second was the foundation of PKK, and the third one was his rejection of the state. I would extend this and say that he does not only reject the state, he rejects all the pillars, foundational principles of capitalist modernity. The entire architecture of liberal capitalist modernity makes him very hard to read as a theory, and as a theorist. And I think this, perhaps, is another thing that adds this condescending attitude that my friend in northern, unnamed northern European country heads towards Orderland, who was somehow reduced to a human rights case, not a sociologist, not a theorist, not a revolutionary leader with great influence, but somebody who should be studied and helped by the Sinti committee and other institutions. He definitely should be. But I think it would be great pity not to learn from the lessons in terms of decolonization, in terms of the way that we think about freedom, sociology of freedom, and all the possibilities. It would be, in other words, a great shame not to read Abdullah as a theorist. So, thank you very much, and... So, get their copies. So, thank you very much, and... Together compose the revolutionary time of the Kurdish freedom. Then there is the spatial issue, I, uh, I, and in the spatial issue, what I can call is structurally in the Kurdish identity uh, built in is uh, crossing the borders because you know the Kurdistan is divided into four countries anything you do is basically border crossing and you can see that of course I use this as, uh, I, I use this as a structural component but also as a metaphor um, in the sense of understanding how Kurds are continuously crossing the borders of politics. What does politic mean? politics mean? What does war mean? Is, uh, what, does, um, what does the social mean? What, the, uh, what is a woman? What is a man? What is nature? Uh, what is acceptable? What is illegal? What is legal? Who is the represented? Represented? Who is the representer? Uh, what is, um, what, what, where are the mountains, uh, uh, where are the plains? Okay, these are continuously um, crossed over. In that sense, space is basically what you do through border crossing. Uh, and finally, the matter of uh, how and basically, I would call what I would say that uh, I could say a lot about the matter, but I will give one example that is friendship. Uh, so, for the Kurdish freedom movement, it's not heterosexuality, it's not, uh, or it's not sexual intimacy, or it's not the family intimacy of family, but it is friendship, the intimacy that friendship and knows one with, the responsibilities that friendship and knows you with, uh, and what you become 
true friendship uh, is um, uh, at the center of this new imagination. And friendship is, uh, it is true friendship that we uh, gain freedom because, you know, it is true friendship that you overcome the spaces of capital, home, uh, property, nation state. It is true friendship that we uh, gain ac access to uh, our truth because uh, we change, we transform true friendship, we become someone else. Um, and um, yeah, and life becomes meaningful, true friendship. It's not individual lives that are important, but it is uh, the lives that we create collectively in the company of friends. Um, so I think uh, I, I gave a really brief summary, extremely brief uh, summary of what I think is worth uh, while uh, for us all, I mean the universal, uh, that is in the Kurdish freedom movement, the, the, the decolonizing, the move uh, that brings about the decolonization of imagination and how this occurs not only at the political level but at the most intimate level, uh, I think can only be understood uh, by um, yeah, by thinking about imagination, by thinking about the symbolic level, but also the um, imaginary level, and yeah. Um, I will finish. I, I, I need like two more hours. <laughs> but I will finish now. Um, uh, on, and now, of course, uh, on a note, um, yeah, I uh, hope uh, David Graeber, I, wa I want to, of course, also um, uh, remember, because as Andre said, that was the last time, uh, I mean, in our last uh, gatherings, we were always with David too. Uh, David, I hope, uh, it has occupied the same t temporality as the Kurdish movement. I think he did. And uh, in the cosmological time of the world, uh, his traces uh, have uh, a lot more work to do. That would be my last words.